where the value of this uh, GSM network is in the number of people that are using it. And if you're the only person using it, then it's not very valuable. If, on the other hand, I somehow manage to convince everyone to start using this thing, it actually becomes very valuable and very useful to everyone involved. But there's actually like a subtle side effect, right? Which is that the old informal mechanisms that people use to collaborate and to communicate are destroyed. That technology actually changes the fabric of society. And you can see this in many small ways, just with things like cell phones, for instance, right? Like it changes uh, the way that people collaborate and communicate. Um, people used to make plans, right? You would say, I'll meet you at this street corner at this time, and we're going to go do this thing. And now people say, I'll call you when I get off work. And that's actually a major shift, right? That if you don't have the means with which to collaborate in that mechanism, then you can't participate in the way that people make plans, you know? And so there's actually this interesting thing where there's an inverse problem now, where if I decide that I don't want to participate in this cellular network, and I leave, I once again am suffering from the no network effect. Because the old informal mechanisms that people used to use to collaborate and to communicate have been destroyed and, and are gone. So I'm once again a part of a network with nobody else. So yes, I chose to have a cell phone. But what kind of choice was it? And I think that this is the way that things are, are heading now, right? Where you start with something that's a very simple choice, a choice of whether or not to have some particular piece of consumer electronics, a mobile phone. And then over time, there's a push to expand the scope of the choice that you have to make, right? Where instead of just the choice between having a mobile phone, eventually it becomes a choice of whether or not you want to participate in society. And that that is beginning to be what we're seeing, right? Where instead of just having a mobile phone or not, it's a question of whether or not I can even participate in society at all. That to choose not to have a mobile phone is, in some ways, making that choice. And I don't think that that's necessarily a real choice or maybe not one that we would have to make, or we should have to make. So I think if you start looking at this trend of small choices becoming big choices, you begin to see it everywhere. Um, one of my most favorite recent examples is with the um, Firefox add-on, Adblock Plus. Are people familiar with this add-on? It's very, yeah, very popular, right? And so the idea is that uh, it's supposed to try and uh, block ads that you would see on the internet. And the way it works is uh, allowing you to specify a list of regular expressions that uh, should match uh, uh, likely ad URLs. And um, this is effective, but the problem is that these regular expressions always sort of need to be changing, right? That uh, new ad networks are introduced, people migrate to different domains, and so you, you need to sort of constantly be updating these things. And so what the Adblock Plus people have done is introduced a, a, a subscriptions model, where what you can do is subscribe to a list of regular expressions that is maintained by someone else, and then as those regular expressions are updated by this maintainer who's sort of on the ball, uh, you are getting the real-time changes. And uh, so there are you know, several po uh, very popular lists. And um, uh, it's expanded now to include not just uh, ad blocking, but also trackers. So there's a list uh, that I was subscribed to to block uh, trackers. These are things that are like web bugs that are going to track your movements around the internet. And one of the trackers that I'm most interested in blocking is uh, Google Analytics, right? Because uh, you know, what is creepier than Google than uh, this particular service? And, uh, so this list that I've subscribed to blocked Google Analytics along with a number of other trackers. And then one day, Google Analytics disappeared from the subscription, that it was no longer being blocked. And if you imagine sort of like the old world, right, you can think of the scenario where there's some Google executive who has found the maintainer of this list and uh, you know, got a briefcase with a bunch of cash in it, and you know there was some shady backroom deal where they shook hands and exchanged the money, and that uh, this maintainer removed Google, Google Analytics from the, uh, the list. But in reality, that's, as far as I can tell, not what happened. Um, so what actually happened is that Google, um, Google Analytics works using JavaScript. That uh, to use Google Analytics, you just include a little bit of JavaScript into your page that you would like to maintain statistics for, and those statistics are automatically generated by the JavaScript that you include. And what Google started to do was include generic JavaScript functions in the JavaScript files that it provides for Google Analytics. So what they say is, well, you know, as long as you're in including this JavaScript file to maintain the Google Analytics stuff for your website, 
we're just going to include some generic functions that you would probably want to use just for the base functionality of your website. And we're going to do this just to be helpful, and we're going to get it right, and it's going to be, you know, support all the browsers just, just so. And so now you can start to use these things in addition to the normal Google Analytics stuff. And so what they've done is expand the scope of the choice that you have to make. Because now, if you block the Google Analytics JavaScript from loading, you're not just breaking the statistics collection, you're breaking the functionality of the website itself. Because now, those generic functions that the website is depending on for its core functionality are no longer there, and the website stops working. So this is a brilliant move on Google's part, right? Where, once again, they've expanded the scope of the choice you have to make from just whether or not you want to uh, participate in the statistics collection to whether or not you can use the website at all. And once the, the, the scope starts to expand, it becomes harder and harder to make the choice not to participate in the statistics collection because you want to use these websites. So why is all this significant for us, right? Well, this man's name is John Poindexter. He is incidentally uh, the person who was found to be most responsible for a lot of the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, he was convicted of lying to Congress, but of course never went to jail, is pardoned or something. And in 2002, he introduced a government program called Total Information Awareness. What he wanted to do was, uh, uh, he made this speech when he introduced this program, and he says, uh, data must be made available in large-scale repositories with enhanced semantic content for easy analysis. Basically what he wanted to do is siphon off all email traffic, all web traffic, all credit card history, everyone's medical records, throw it into one big sink without worrying about analyzing it in real time. Just collect all the data. And then once you have it and continue to accumulate it, you develop algorithms that will very efficiently mine that data to pull out profiles, statistics, relationships, whatever it is that you want at any given time. And so this was the totalitarian future, right? This was the cypherpunk nightmare that they had predicted all along. This is what they had been preparing for. And when this was announced, people freaked out, right? Well, why did they freak out? Well, on one hand, um, you know, because this is just so obviously the cypherpunk nightmare that people have been talking about for so long. But on the other hand, they, they just didn't really do it right. You know, these are people obviously from the old world. They don't understand how things work now. This was their actual logo for the government program. <laughs> this wasn't like The Onion came up with something to describe it. This is the logo that they chose. They have like the eye of God on the pyramid, conjuring all the Masonic shit with a light beam shining down on the planet, you know? That little bit of Latin means knowledge is power. I mean, they fucked this up, right? You know, like if, if you're gonna do something like this, if you're gonna have this crazy, scary government program, you need like a, like a friendly image. You, you know, just pick like a, like a teddy bear or something, you know, like call it the kitten surveillance society, you know? Don't call it total information awareness. I mean, really what you want is something that's um, kind of like colorful, something that's playful, almost cartoonish, that seems harmless, you know? Something like this. Because <laughs> these people did it right, you know? If you look at what Total Information Awareness was trying to do, and then you compare it to what Google is doing now, they're doing all of it. In fact, they're exceeding what Total Information Awareness was trying to do. You know, they've got all your email, all your web traffic, They've got your purchase records. They've got your medical records now. And if there's one thing that we know that Google has thrived on, it's the ability to take a large, insanely, amount of informa insanely huge amount of information and very efficiently mine it to pull out the little profiles, the, the, the statistics that make sense. So obviously their intent is different, right? They're trying to sell advertising. You know, John Poindexter is trying to do something else. But make no mistake about it, they are in the surveillance business. That is what they do. It's a surveillance business. That is how they make money. And so the effect is the same. There's this quote, who knows more about the citizens in their own country, Kim Jong-il or Google? <laughs> right, I think it's obviously Google. And you know, the question once again is, why do we continue to use Google? Or you know, why, don't we, why do we freak out about Kim Jong-il? You know, why, why is everyone scared of this person? And we're not scared of Google. And I think, again, it comes down to this question of choice. That there's, a, there's this, um, I would say, illusion of an option that is presented to you where you can choose to participate in Google services and Kim Jong-il is going to do his thing whether you want to or not. 
But again, I would say that the choice is expanding, that the scope of this choice is becoming larger and larger, and eventually it's going to encompass the choice of whether or not